We are in Senior English B, and now we're going to uh, briefly comment on Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Kubla Khan on page 846-847. I want to say two things about this poem, and then I've got a little exper experience with the poem itself that you're going to have that's uh, video-driven. One, there's two ways to think about poetry. One way is to see poems as where you go to learn something. In other words, the poem is going to teach you something. In other words, you finish reading Ten Turn Abbey and you're supposed to know something. You finish reading Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and you're supposed to know something. In other words, the poem teaches you something. Got me? There's a second way, though, that poems sometimes get written. And they have nothing so much to do with learning anything, but rather the poem is about what you experience. What you experience. In other words, it's only about the way the poem makes you feel, and that is all. There isn't any intended message. There isn't any intended teaching, right? The poem is completely constructed, constructed to make you feel or experience certain things. Now, the Romantic poets will play both games, all right? We've studied a lot of poems that are having these meanings to them, right? Ten Turn Abbey and Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner come to mind. But now we're going to hit Kublai Khan. And for those of you who started reading this poem looking for the quote-unquote message of this poem, and you couldn't find it at 2A, there's a reason why. There ain't no message. Or if there is a message, it's going to be implied through the experience of the poem itself. Okay? Kublai Khan, then, is not a poem that's going to teach you something it's rather going to allow you to experience something. Well, what is that? Well, number two. Kublai Khan is a poem about a famous Chinese emperor, a great Mongol warrior, who was really scary, really afraid. For those of you who grew up as little kids, maybe watching the Disney film Mulan, you know all about that really bad guy at the beginning of the, of the film, of that cartoon film. So you know about the bad guy, right? And he's intended to be really a scary guy. That's this guy, okay? Similar kind of guy, right? But mean, wicked kind of emperor, mean warrior type who builds this beautiful palace called Xanadu, okay? And Coleridge knew about this, and he writes a poem about the experience of Xanadu. Now all I need you to do is just watch my uh, video, take down a few notes at the beginning, and we're just going to have the experience of the poem itself, all right? Have you ever been awakened in the middle of a fantastic dream? For a while, you remember it, but then it fades, unless you write it down. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the English romantic poet, once recorded the dream he had after reading a book about travel to the Far East. A sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice, a sacred river, and ancestral voices prophesying war. These were among the images, both beautiful and sinister, that Coleridge saw in his dream and which became his classic lyric poem, Kubla Khan. Now, Kubla Khan was a real person, a Mongol emperor of the 13th century, and one of history's most powerful conquerors. But Coleridge set him down in an imaginary place. It was a kind of paradise, a palace of mythic proportions called Xanadu. The rhythmic chant of the language, though, conveys foreboding. Perhaps you felt it as you read the poem. You are about to see Kubla Khan set to music and presented as a montage, a collection of images. As you listen and watch, think about your experience reading the poem. How do your own images of Xanadu compare with these? In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests, ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm, which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedar cover. 
a savage place, as holy and enchanted as air beneath a waning moon, was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast, thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced. Amid whose swift, half-intermitted burst, huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks at once and ever, it flung up momently the sacred river, five miles meandering with a mazy motion. Through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult, Kubla heard from far, ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves. Where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves? It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer, in a vision once I saw, it was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Avora. Could I revive within me a symphony and song? To such a deep delight t'would win me, that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. All right, now let's kind of uh, just make some summative comments about Kubla Khan, the poem. Right away, let's make an observation at 2B, that this is a poem that's going to emphasize the, the language, the rhythms, right? What kind of mood does this poem and the language of this poem wish to somehow create? What kind of feeling or mood? But let me ask it this way. Is it a happy, giddy mood? It's not, is it? Well, then what kind of mood is it? If it's not a happy, giddy mood, then what kind of mood is it? How would you, what, what adjective would you write down in your, in your annotations for this? The mood or the feeling of this poem is one of what? Peaceful. Peaceful? Keep going. It's kind of quiet, kind of tranquil. We might say solitude. Kind of dark. dark, though, also. Haunting. The sense that something bad is coming, right? Even in this faraway, romantic place, bad things might be coming. Right? That speak of the end, maybe we would say, of this present experience. Now, if anyone has tried to find the messages of a poem like this, although they're a little bit more difficult, like I said, this is more about a poem of experience than simply teaching, it has been that realization that you don't always know what's coming. And the best of experiences and the best of times, sooner or later, have to come to some kind of an end. Which makes you treasure or not so much treasure the positive experiences more. See, this, this argument can run either way. So, for example, today will be the last day of a January you will ever have as a high school student. You will never do it again. Ever. It's over. And about that, some of you will say, yes. And about that, some of you will say, yeah, but at the same time, that's, I guess that's kind of sad. If not sad, it kind of makes me pause and think about the fact that for 12 straight years, every January, I was in school because I had to go. This will be it. I'll never have to do that again. If I'm ever in school again after this January, it'll be because I choose to be there, not because I have to be there. And how does that make me kind of feel? See, it makes you, in a word, reflective, doesn't it? It makes you kind of think back. 
And you'll begin to find yourself as you age doing this more and more, where you become kind of reflective and you kind of look back. Think about, cause we, always, we always think about our own experience of graduation. What will the experience of graduation be like for the people who raised you? In a minute, they will be watching you walk the track, but in their mind's eye, they'll see you as a little kid they took to the park. And just like that, they're back in time. And yet, there you are, walking out onto the track. Is it any wonder that those people who you live with will be a little bit happy-sad? in the moment of graduation. You, on the other hand, you're a kid. Yay, right? It will take time for you to come to this ability to become more reflective in those rite of passage moments where you go, oh yeah, everything's shifting. Of course, now that I've said it and we've read this poem, you can begin to think of it in those terms as well, right? Happy and yet at the same time a little bit sad. Perplexed is the word that Wordsworth used in Tetra Abbey. It's a pretty good word as well. Okay, thank you guys.